brand of this guitar is, is called an Emmons pedal steel guitar. And uh, this kind of guitar was invented by a man named Buddy Emmons, who was... Uh... <laughs> That's good too. To steal your tricks. <laughs> we could. We could. You were mine. There we go. So, um, I don't think so anyway, he um, he died two years ago, but he kind of sort of took the steel guitar out of um, kind of the country western stone age. And uh, he, he played a very beautiful country and he also like, played Pat Martino too. So he was a, quite an accomplished musician. So, um, so here's one that you'll uh, recognize about a river uh, that's not too far from where we are. Some ways, although it's, it's a little soggier these days, but uh, it was a, it was the oil boom. Uh, it was kind of a strange strange time to be playing. The oil boom combined with uh, urban cowboy. So, oh, 
<laughs> so there's, there's, uh, you didn't really have to be good to find a lot of work, which was yeah. good for me at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked a lot. You, uh, uh, um, I think we, we were talking, and it, it seems like uh, there's like a very strict way to do things in country music, and that's all fine and good, but uh, sometimes you were trying to stretch out, you met with some resistance. Yeah, um, I met resistance when I started playing the kind of music uh, that I play now. Yeah. Uh, mostly from steel guitar players. The people who love country music were kind of blissfully unaware of that. Um, country music is a strange thing, and I'm not sure I really understood it at the time, but it's like haiku. Uh, you have a, a very strict form. You go outside of that form, and it's not haiku anymore. And it's the same with that. So uh, you would do... Um, so you'd kick up a song like... Dissonance that uh, 
just sort of, I, I just related to. Um, probably, probably after that second time I fell on my head from the tree. <laughs> but, um, and uh, Frank Zappa had mentioned that uh, Edgar Varetz yeah. was one of his, his, his idols. So I went and I was in middle school and went out and bought an album of Edgar Varetz doing uh, Amari. And so I was listening to that and Frank Zappa and, and things just went downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you started playing country music. Yeah, right. So you had all that in you the whole time. Right, so when I played country music, uh, I would do that for, for gigs and and, uh, and not just like, oh yeah, I'm doing that for money, but what I really like is this. I mean, I, I like everything. Yeah. And uh, so I was listening to John Coltrane, Albert Isla. Uh, I was listening to, you know, just all kinds of different music. John Cage. Um, so I was doing that and playing country gigs, and I think that's where you know, I would, I would, I would go out into my um, car and listen to cassettes between uh, mm -hmm. between sets, and I listen to Albert Eiler, and then uh, <laughs> you know, have to go and, and do the kickoff to Crazy Arms or something. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought I was playing it just perfectly, but they, they noticed <laughs> something that was different. You know? And that's the thing when you get an insular style of music, uh, anything that's a little bit different. People notice, and you know, there's, you know, there's like a, there's like a Taliban for every kind of music, and country music has a very strong. Do you think, and I don't want to project, um, so I'm purely asking, do you think that uh, that might have been heightened because you were a woman? Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Um, and and being a woman uh, in bands back then. There's a weird dynamic to that. For one, they, 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 people who want, there's some people that it doesn't matter. If you play, you can play, and that's what they want. Uh, but there's an element of they, they, they want eye candy. You're no longer eye candy, then you're not part of the world. Uh, and there's the whole submissive thing. Um, and uh, so I remember guitar players would come up and one time a steel guitar player came up and, and played, and they were like, I'm going to show you how to play. And it's like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> and they would play, you know, their, their fanciest licks, and I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm that good, but I could play circles around them, and I did. I played what they did backwards. <laughs> and uh, so eventually you get some respect, but I think maybe for women it's, it's harder to earn that respect. But I, I think, having said that, I think things have uh, uh, come a long way. I think, you know, things have changed a bit. We're getting there. So, so um, back to, <laughs> back to, uh, to Jazz. So you were listening to John Coltrane and some Courtney Coleman, and along with uh, classical music. Could you, I guess, uh, uh, you tunes? Sure. I'll um, let me switch guitars to do this sure. because this guitar uh, is good for, but not so much for the other kind of music. And, and I'll maybe go into how they're different. Sure, that'd be great. When I was playing country music in Houston, there was a keyboard player. And everybody said, "Oh, he's the greatest." He's the one that played with purple harem, whiter shade of pale. That's how you know. Everybody believed that. And I was like, oh wow, that's so cool. You know, I, I tell people, yeah, I so, and so, you know, played with him and you know, he's the one on whiter shade of pale. And then I saw a video of whiter shade of pale on YouTube. Somebody else. <laughs> so um, before I play the uh, let me go into So this guitar is tuned slightly different. The other one is basically tuned to a chord, and everything goes either up or down. And this one, things will kind of go both ways. Um, and there's a little bit more room for dissonance. So, um, 
started learning um, steel guitar tunes, and uh, here's a few of them, just very, very briefly. <laughs>
Amen. So I was, as I was uh, listening, uh, first I was watching up here, then I started looking at your right foot. There's a lot going on with, uh, with the volume in pedal steel. The volume, the volume pedal is, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, I would say, speaking for me, I would say the, uh, the most difficult part of the instrument is the right hand, uh, followed very closely by the uh, the, the volume, because if you're not like... <laughs> and, and getting it to not be like that is, um, takes some work. Uh, but if you're doing it right, you're really, you're really, um, uh, bringing different atmospheres to, um, to the, uh, the notes, to the chords. Uh, the volume pedal is kind of like the lungs, you know, you're breathing. So that's how the instrument breathes, is with the volume pedal. Beautiful. Awesome. Uh, so, so should we, we move on into uh, even further out? Well, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll talk about a country gig I did um, okay. about 25 years ago. And um, so I was, uh, you know, not listening to the country radio on my way to the gig. You know, I was playing at a, a bar, a dance hall in downtown Houston. And I was driving up the freeway, and I was listening to the classical station. And the classical station in Houston, as in most places, you know, it's just the, the old workhorses, you know, Tchaikovsky, Brahms, Beethoven, whatever. But for some reason they were playing um, uh, Olivier Messiaen's um, Et Expecto Resurrectuum Mortuorum, uh, which means, which translates as And I Await the Resurrection of the Dead, which is a piece that he wrote for, uh, for wind instruments and percussion. And uh, so it was one of those moments where, where I don't know if, if any of you all have, have had this, where you're listening to something on the radio and it grabs you so much, you just have, sort of have to pull over yeah. uh, until I, I couldn't even drive. So I just pulled over onto the, uh, on the side of the, the road and, uh, and waited till it was over mm -hmm. and then got back on the freeway and then went to the club and uh, there was the rest of the band looking at me like, you know, you know, why are you uh, 15 minutes late to the gig? And uh, of course, I had to tell them as soon as Olivia Messiaen, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I thought, oh, this is such a beautiful, it's a cool tune. I, 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 I think I can do this. So um, this was back in the um, in the 80s, maybe late 80s, mid 80s. And uh, so I, I ordered the, uh, the score. You know, you couldn't do it online. You know, you had to find a, a music store or whatever, a place that sold sheet music. And it was like, you know, 20 different staves and all different sort of, uh, you know, the baritone clef and, and all this. And, um, you know, one was in A flat, one was in D or whatever. And um, after looking at it, I thought, I, this is just not going to work. But, and, you know, I was so full of hubris back then, you know, that kind of hubris of you. And, but I, I kept it in the back of my mind. And I, I'd always wanted to figure out some way to translate that music to the pedal steel guitar. And um, so in 2005, uh, I was on tour doing my solo music in Italy and uh, met up with uh, Alvin Curran, the, the great... Uh, Composer and uh, my friend um, uh, Mike Cooper, who plays sort of this weird sort of Hawaiian guitar, and we were in Rome, Italy, and we attended uh, uh, a, uh, a concert in tribute to the um, uh, the, uh, the Italian composer um, uh, Chelsea, uh, Jacinto Chelsea. And uh, all these different composers had uh, 
contributed pieces uh, to uh, celebrate his, 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 his musical life, and Alvin Curran was one of them. And so I, I, I came back to, uh, to Houston where I was living, and I was kind of all fired up, and I thought, you know, I'm going to try this again. And what I'm going to do, what I'll do is I'll go as far with this one as I can, and then um, when I can't play it anymore, then uh, I'll just make up something on my own, which is what I did. And it was a great success. I was actually, this time, I was able to do it. So I was able to play Levier Messiens, Ed Expecto Orchum Morchumorum, and then my own. And uh, with his music, I was able to get as far as the first three notes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that, that piece is, is one of the reasons that I have this steel guitar.
So at the end, the end, I I, um, I went into Tristan and Esau, uh, Richard Wagner's Tristan and Esau, and the reason I decided to do that one is um, uh, I watched the movie Melancholia. Any of you have seen that movie? Uh, kind of a, not, not quite a cheery film, but that was the, the that was the theme music when the world was ending, and uh, it just just struck me, and I thought. Yeah, I remember uh, in uh, in college when uh, my uh, music professor has passed away now. Um, he played us that on the piano, uh, Tristan Isidold, and when he gets to that chord, you know <laughs> that 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 yes. Right, there's like there's like this kind of silent. Thank <laughs> you. 